So I want to start by welcoming Kim Ratas, an author and analyst, more than 20 years of experience in print and broadcast media covering the Middle East, international affairs and US foreign policy. And recently, uh, her second book, Black Wave on the Saudi-Iran rivalry was a New York Times top 100 notable book of 2020 and has become a reference for universities and diplomats. Welcome, Kim. It's, I gotta say, it's good to finally e-meet you. I think that's, that's what I'm gonna go yeah, with. Thank you for doing this. Thank you to the Meshidja Foundation for organizing this important conference every year. I'm delighted to participate. To participate. And um, I'm well, as well as can be these days in Beirut. It's, it's, it's nice to put back my journalist hat and I'm talking to really, I gotta say, la crème de la crème in many, many thank ways. You. And they don't pay me for compliments, but yeah, you you know you talk about being in Beirut, um, and really, you know, it's November 2021, and we look back on the last two years, and we think, what has happened, right? I think in the last two years alone, Lebanon has been through so much. And in a recent article for the Atlantic, I know you drew a par parallel between the situation in Hong Kong, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. And you said that although the situations in all three territories are radically different, we have a common denominator, which is the erosion of freedoms. And, um, you know, Lebanon today is suffering. And as a journalist, also as a Lebanese national and a citizen, how do you wrap your head around what's happening? You know, as, as journalists, we are privileged uh, in a way, as authors, as journalists, as thinkers, we are privileged because we usually, not always, um, are supposed to have and have the ability and the time to step backwards, to take a step back and to think about the big picture. It's not always easy anymore in Lebanon, including for journalists, because daily life is harsh for everyone. Um, but I try to take the time that I can to step back and look at the big picture as much as I can. And as I lived through the last two years of upheaval in Lebanon, and it was my choice to, to stay in Lebanon, it is a very personal choice that some people make. Um, some people decide to leave and you can't criticize them for it or fault them for it. You also can't um, question those who stay. Uh, everyone has their reasons why they make a decision one way or another, but I decided to stay. I feel it's important for me to be here, to be part of the conversation here, to contribute as best as I can to trying to understand what is happening in Lebanon. And that's how I, over the last few months, came towards this conclusion that there were so much in common between what, has, what was happening in Lebanon, in Hong Kong, and in Afghanistan. Because yes, they're radically different. Uh, Lebanon, the sort of the freewheeling market economy, you know, multi-sectarian history of emigration. Hong Kong, a city that used to be British colony, um, now uh, facing, you know, Chinese hegemony, but thriving so far economically. And of course, Afghanistan, a country with a difficult past of invasions and occupations and um, withdrawals and more invasions, the rise of the Taliban, etc. But what these three places have gone through, a collapse of a system, a collapse of a space for freedom, a disappearing, an erasure of progress in all these three places, progress which was imperfect, but it was progress nonetheless. It was a sense that there was a future, that there was something to look forward to. Lebanon was leaving behind its history of civil war, of upheaval. Um, it was you know, maintaining some semblance of economic, um, of economic life. But suddenly over the last year and a half, you've had this collapse in all these three places. And I was stunned sitting in Beirut, reading these headlines about Hong Kong. And one of them in particular really struck me. It said, um, fearing reign of terror, Hong Kong families flee the city. And I thought, wow, you know, this could be Beirut. 
you know, and in August of this year, it was Afghanistan. And so I started thinking about what was the common denominator. And as we've been saying, it is this loss of, of hope. It is the curtailing of freedoms, the um, sort of sudden uh, uh, arrested development, if you will. And that's very hard to deal with for, for people in all these three places. And I think the umbrella thought um, around these three places is the end of a you know, system um, that came about towards the end of the Cold War in the 90s, where there was a sense of the inevitability of progress of democracy, that eventually China would also liberalize, that eventually even a country like Afghanistan um, would either be not a problem because it was far away um, or would also make inevitable progress towards democracy, that Lebanon, uh, despite everything, despite Syrian occupation, despite the presence of militant groups like Hezbollah would continue on this path forward. But democracy is, is not guaranteed and democracy can come under attack everywhere, including in America. And so when I try to wrap my head around what is going on in Lebanon, I try to uh, put, uh, to, to look at the big picture, because I think it's also always important whenever possible for those people who have the bandwidth, the ability to not be consumed by the misery of day-to-day -day life here, um, to think about the big picture and to find in those common threads an explanation for what is happening and hopefully um, a, 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 a path forward, which is very important. Let's let's talk about let's talk about an explanation for what is happening. I mean, today, you know, you think Lebanon has lost 40% of its doctors, 30% of its nurses, countless numbers of professors from prestigious institutions, just you know, like the American University of Beirut have left the country and there is a serious brain drain. And it's it's sad to see because the real richness, if you will, of Lebanon is its people. Um, and this is known both locally and internationally that we have some of the brightest minds, some of the most creative uh, talent as well. Um, how can we ensure that the conversation about Lebanon keeps going? And what, you, let's start with that. How can we ensure that the conversation about Lebanon does not fade? That's a very good question because in this world of turmoil where, um, you know, there is talk about uh, not just Afghan, Afghanistan's withdrawal, but the rise of China, climate change, you know, the pandemic. It's very easy to be forgotten. We are, after all, a small country. We like to think that we're the center of the world. And in a way, we are, I think. Um, but we are a small country. We do sit at, you know, um, the nexus of various geopolitical trends. But it's not all about us. And yet, I do think that Lebanon has a lot to offer. It's not just a problem. It can also be part of the solution. So I think that the way to make sure that the conversation doesn't fade away, that the focus on Lebanon doesn't go away, is for journalists to continue to write in ways that are accessible to the international community, to step away a little bit from the nitty gritty of which politician said what and which leader did what, and to zoom out a little bit to explain this story as this you know, conference is doing, as reporters in Lebanon who write for the Washington Post or write for the New York Times are doing. And it's great to see more Lebanese mm -hmm. as correspondents for international news organizations. That's how you ensure in one way that the conversation doesn't move away from, from Lebanon. A very interesting fact that you mentioned is that we really are at the nexus of you know, geopolitically. In other words, we happen to be really situated in <clears throat> fortunate or an unfortunate, as a lot of people and a lot of analysts like to say, um, location, geography, and if you, if you will, are people's loyalties. And it's just today when you see what's happening, and I think this is important to mention with Saudi Arabia and the ambassador leaving and people in Saudi Arabia calling Lebanese people who work there saying, well, am, is my job safe? Am I gonna have to be, am I gonna get kicked out? What do you make of that? So I think it's important to make two points here. One, um, we are, 
at the nexus of regional geopolitics. And there are larger um, uh, issues at play in Lebanon that are not all in our control. And it's important to acknowledge that, and it's important to understand how they play out. So that's one. But we are also willing players as Lebanese in this you know, regional power play. And that's important to acknowledge as well. And we have to reckon with that. Um, we cannot say, oh, it's about America. Oh, it's the Israelis. Oh, it's the Saudis. Oh, it's the Iranians. Everyone is playing a role in this. Willingly, unwillingly, everyone is playing a role. The political you, leadership in this country is playing a role. You're absolutely right. But the reason I'm asking about this is, you know, there's this new diplomatic rift between the GCC and Lebanon. But on the other hand, Saudi is resuming talks with historical rival Iran. And, you know, how can we view the future of geopolitical alliances in the region when this is happening? Mm -hmm. Because it's it uh, Lebanon in a very... Yes. Um, I, I will get to that, but I, I want to make the second point, which is that we also must acknowledge that not all our problems are, are about the region. And not all our problems are, are about Saudi Arabia and about, you know, Iran and about Israel and about America or caused by any of these players. You know, corruption in Lebanon is the doing of probably every single person in this country to some extent. Um, everyone plays a role willingly or unwillingly. There are problems that we can solve which do not require a detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which do not require um, Iran and the United States agreeing to, uh, uh, to resume the nuclear, the nuclear deal, to return to the nuclear deal. There are problems in Lebanon that can be solved by, by us. And we cannot postpone these solutions while we wait for the regional, you know, whatever to, to come together. Um, so when it comes to the rift that uh, Saudi Arabia just, um, um, you know, that just unfolded, with Saudi Arabia, it's very distressing for the Lebanese to see that they are yet again, um, in a way, um, victims of a regional power play that many of them feel they have nothing to do with. You look at Lebanese who live in Saudi Arabia, you look at exporters, industrialists in Lebanon who export to the kingdom. You know, this is all very difficult for the people. And so how the rift plays out is predict, but what the Lebanese can, can do to the extent possible is to be a voice for themselves in these issues and not just allow the narrative to be taken over by these players. I think, you know, as much as Saudi officials want to say that, you know, they withdrew their ambassador because they're just done with Lebanon. I would like to posit that actually they're not done. And that's why they withdrew their ambassador. Because otherwise, you know, you can just have the comment of this minister sit there in, you know, in the ether and not care about it. But it was a way of provoking a change in the status quo in Lebanon, which no longer suits Saudi Arabia. That's my analysis. And it's a way of forcing a conversation with the United States about Lebanon and about Hezbollah and Hezbollah's role, not only in Lebanon, but also in the wider region. Because so far, Saudi Arabia has only had one conversation with the US since President's come into power. And that's been about Yemen, and it's been about human rights, and it's about a few other things. But Saudi Arabia wants to, in my view, talk to the US about the regional issue, the regional chessboard. Iran is very content talking about the regional chessboard only with regional players and about um, the issue of nuclear, its nuclear program with the US and, and other international powers. But th those are two separate tracks that kind of need to be combined. And I think eventually, I don't know, uh, we might see a regional discussion. You know, recent sanctions imposed by the US on three Lebanese businessmen was a first. And not only do they target men from both sides of the Lebanese political spectrum, but also they are the first sanctions imposed by a nation on people in Lebanon that are recognized as guilty of corruption and embezzlement. And, mm. you know, I think about the revolution or the uprising, which is probably a better way of calling it, that started two years ago in October. 
And I think about everything that's happened since, including the August 4th explosion. And these, these political leaders just, you know, as resilient as the people are, the political re leaders are also very resilient. Nothing really shakes them or moves them or faces them. So can it's this- It's existential for them. You know, it's existential. There is no golden parachute that is going to allow them to leave power easily and not face some consequences. So it's existential. And these uh, sanctions by the US Treasury Department are in line with a White House memorandum that came out over the spring or the summer that declared corruption or the fight against corruption to be a national security interest priority of the US because corruption undermines governance. It undermines the rule of law. It undermines democracy. It feeds illiberal forces, not just in Lebanon, but everywhere. And so the Biden administration has made the fight, of, uh, the fight against corruption a, a priority for its various departments, including DOD, the Department of Defense, but also um, um, Treasury, uh, State Department, etc. But that kind of work takes a long time. If you think back to the work that the FBI had to do to bring down the mob in New York in the 80s, it took years once you start. And um, that's what, it's, what it feels like to me sometimes, that this is a sort of slow chipping away at the power of an entrenched elite that has been you know, lining its, its pockets. In, in Lebanon, and that takes time. And you don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater, but you want to chip away and start constraining the ability to empty the coffers of the state or you know, whatever is left. It, and it, you know, it's interesting because it, then it brings me to question that you know, on social <clears throat> media, we see so much lobbying for people and expats to kind of register for the Lebanese parliamentary elections that are scheduled for next March of 2022. And, you know, I want to ask first, do you believe the elections will go on as scheduled? And, you know, the voices that you speak about, can we finally, finally see them making a breakthrough? So I, I don't have a crystal ball and I can't tell you what sort of, you know, last minute surprises. Uh, Based on what we know. <laughs> It's, I mean, at the moment, they're supposed to go ahead. And so, you know, I, I don't have insider information about whether somebody is planning to make them happen or not make them happen. Certainly what I can say is that the international community is going to insist that these elections take place. But with every little, you know, um, event that takes place that throws um, some turmoil onto the scene, there's a potential that the authorities will say, oh, you know, things are too unstable. We can't have any elections. We can't guarantee the safety of voters. We don't have what it takes for the army to deploy to secure, you know, electoral, um, you know, election, uh, election polling stations, etc. So I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, people have a tendency to overinterpret statements like the one I've just made. I don't have any information. I'm just saying that we live in uh, uncertain times but that the pressure from the international community will be very strong to maintain this very important moment in Lebanon's um, you know, electoral calendar, because other elections will take place next year as well, including the presidential elections, and if all goes well, municipal elections. And it's time, it's time for a new class of potential future political leaders to, to rise and to have a chance at running this, this country. And what it requires is a united opposition. We don't have that, do we? A, a platform, it requires, sorry? We don't have that though, do we? That's something that we, you know. I know that various groups are, are working together. Um, there's been some efforts to unite electoral machine platforms um, that hasn't gone according to plan. But look, remember, it's, it's not a push button exercise. This is hard work. Politics is hard work. What people need to understand is that revolutions don't produce 
perfect elections with democratic results. Um, revolutions don't build states, they only bring down states. And so that's what we've had across the region over the last 10 years, right? We've had revolutions that brought down people, that brought down Hosni Mubarak or, um, or, uh, or Muammar Gaddafi. But then to build a state, it's a lot more work. And sometimes there's a counter revolution. And so what young people are realizing across the region is that it's not enough to just bring down the system. You have to run for elections. And it's not something that comes naturally to most people in the Arab world, including in Lebanon, because people think the game is rigged, that it's corrupt, that you have to you know, kiss the hand of the leader, you have to accept money or give money, et cetera. And so a lot of people don't want to participate, but it's essential to participate and to try to effect change that way, not only to run, but also to, to vote, because that's been the big gap over the last you know, couple of, of elections that participation has been has been very low and voter turnout is going to be essential this time. Yeah, I think that's it's really important when you think about it because we spoke about the voices and we spoke about you know possible civil society and these independent groups that are not affiliated of you know finally making a breakthrough to maybe maybe bring back this idea of hope or a future, a viable future for Lebanon. I want to wrap it up and talk Bring it, bring it home, literally and figuratively speaking, you know. Um, but before you do, Yuma, if, if you just keep hold that thought, but I, I want to add one thing. I, I want to say that it's very important not to give up if the elections don't produce the, you know, uh, the sea change. Politics are hard. Building democracies is hard. Maybe the opposition the various opposition groups, because you're right, it's not a united opposition, but certainly I think there will be uh, people standing for every single one of the 128 seats in parliament, new faces. And so even if they win 10 seats or they win 20 seats, which you know is not a sea change, but it's a beginning. Look at Iraq, you know, Iraq just had its elections. I think it's very important to compare ourselves to others and not to dismiss other people's, uh, um, you know, we have different histories with Iraq and people in Beirut can say, oh, you know, Iraqis, they, you know, it's just a different system. They had a dictatorship for so many years. That's not where we are. But you can learn from other people's example. And the Iraqi opposition um, in Iraq won, you know, not that many seats, but overall there was a big change in the electoral landscape. And that's something to build on. And so the first step will be small, but that doesn't mean that we should say, oh, you know, it's never gonna work. And so we just give up. I think it's just going to be, you know, um, slow, progressive uh, uh, efforts that will, you know, not always succeed, but, you know, that you have to build on again and again. Again, but, you know, this is, this is a good segue into my last wrap up question, which is really, you know, about bringing it home, literally and figuratively. One of the things that stood out when you and I were talking before this was that, you know, you said to me, well, you know, I'm in Beirut, I plan to stay, and this is where I'm going to be. And I thought, you know, for so many of us, um, <clears throat> including, including myself, you know, that, you know, you, we had to leave, not because we wanted to, but a lot of us felt that, you know, we were leaving because um, it was also a matter of survival for some. And I love, you said, don't judge those who leave and don't judge those who stay. Um, what makes you stay? Hmm. Uh, a combination of things. Um, my, uh, my elderly mother, um, uh, my, uh, my sister who also lives here, it's family. Um, my very strong community of friends. Uh, we live close by, we always are, we're always together um, and just, my, uh, you know, privileged position, I realized to be somewhat in control of the chaos around me in the sense that I feel more in control when I'm talking about the chaos, explaining it to others. I feel less overwhelmed by it. I feel less, I feel that I have agency. And that's why I wanted to become a journalist because growing up in Lebanon during the civil war, you know, you are a child and there's nothing you can do about what's happening around you. 
But becoming a journalist helped me make sense of the chaos around me and helped me feel like I wasn't just, I mean, victim is not the right word because you know we came out unscathed miraculously from the civil war, but it made me feel less like I was not in control. Of course, you know, I'm not changing people's minds. I'm not, you know, drawing lines on a map, but it just gives you a sense of, of agency that you're out there, you're talking to people, you are, you know, maybe participating in the conversation, maybe changing some people's minds. And for me, I think it's an important moment to, to witness. Um, I feel more Zen than others about power cuts and, uh, you know, uh, petrol shortages for some reason. Um, maybe it is the experience of growing up in, in the Civil War. Here. I got organized. I, I got organized. I know it's very difficult for people. It's very difficult for people who have children who didn't know whether schools were going to open or not and what were they going to do and was it the right thing to stay or was it the right thing to go. But, you know, I have friends who left with their children and who eventually decided to come back. And I have friends who said, I am never leaving. And suddenly they're packing their bags and they are leaving. And so again, these are difficult choices. They're personal choices. And, you know, don't hold me to it. Maybe, you know, tomorrow some organization will call and make me a dream offer for a job that I cannot refuse. And, you know, I'll be talking to you from New York or Singapore or somewhere. But as much okay. as I can control, Sorry? Come back. But you'll come back. You <laughs> well, we always come back, right? We always come back. That's the thing about the Lebanese. We leave, we come back, we return, we visit, we move away for a few years, we come back for a few years. But I know that a lot of people deep down feel that this country has really not done right by them. And they've given up and they've you know, put a cross um, on it. And, and I hope that the next year will bring a bit of hope um, a bit of a path forward that will reignite people's um, love for this country if they've lost it and encourage them to participate. And I know the diaspora is very involved and wants to see uh, an opportunity for this country to, to move forward. And, um, you know, and I hope I'll, I'll be here to continue to witness it and, and write about it and make sure that Lebanon doesn't disappear from the conversation uh, in the international media or in diplomatic circles and universities and so on. Kim, thank you. Thank you so much, Yumna. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for this great conversation. Thank you for this conference um, and the ability to be able to do it from two different countries, but still contribute um, just as equally with, again, a lot of, you know, it's, it's, diff it's a difficult time. There's a lot of turmoil and a lot of despair, but at the same time, people have not lost hope. And I think Kim is also very much uh, the epitome of that and a living proof of that. So thank you for your time and thank you to the Meishigia Foundation. Thank you, thank you.